Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. Ready to get 30, 30, ready to get 30, ready to get 20, 20, 20, ready to get 20, 20, ready to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month. So give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. In breaking news, Leading scientists worldwide are conducting experiments to determine if Reese's peanut butter cups are the perfect combination of peanut butter and chocolate. However, it appears the study was inconclusive, as the scientists couldn't help but eat all the Reese's. Because when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's. Find Reese's now at a store near you. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Welcome to the Travel Squad Podcast. We adventure the world together one passport stamp at a time. We're here to share travel news, tips, and our own adventures with you. Every Travel Tuesday, we share stories on a variety of topics, including our hometown San Diego, hiking, weekenders, national parks, international getaways, and inspiring you to go on your own adventures, even if it starts with your own backyard. I'm Jamal. Brittany. And I'm Kim. And And we're we're the the Travel Travel Squad Squad Podcast. Podcast. So grab your ticket and your passport. And don't forget your travel insurance. And prepare for takeoff. Hello, fellow travelers. Hey, Sporty Sporties. Welcome to this week's episode of the Travel Squad Podcast. We have a very special guest joining us today, Gary Arndt. In March 2007, Gary sold his house and started traveling the world. During his travels, he visited all seven continents, 204 countries, and every U.S. state and territory. Gary has accomplished quite a lot in his travels. While traveling, he taught himself travel photography. He was named Photographer of the Year three times from various different publications. He also now runs a travel-adjacent podcast called Everything Everywhere Podcast that releases episodes daily, and he knows something about everywhere, which makes this episode so fascinating and inspires you to see places you might not have even known about. In this episode, we talk with Gary about his photography career, his podcast, and his travels as we play a rapid-fire game as we try to stump Gary with some very interesting but lesser-known travel destinations. And with that, let's welcome Gary to the Travel Squad podcast. All right, Gary, we are so excited to have you on the podcast today. And one of the questions that we like to start with all of our guests is that We want to go way back. What is your very first or very best travel memory that you can recall? Oh boy. One of the first ones would probably be my parents taking a trip to the Wisconsin Dells, which is kind of this touristy area in Wisconsin. You know, they serve fudge, which is pretty much the definition of a tourist area uh, because no place else serves fudge other than tourist spots. Uh, and I remember, you know, they have these things the, the Dells are a section of the Wisconsin river that are kind of like a, a small Canyon. And they have these things where there were ducks, uh, which are amphibious vehicles. They were the same ones used in world war II. They refurbished them. And so you'd start out on land and then you'd go into the water and then you'd go back on land and go back in and stuff. Uh, that's one that I remember, uh, I think it was 1978. We took a trip to, uh, South Dakota, Wyoming. Uh, that's one I certainly remember. So yeah, that, those would probably be it. Do you think that traveling young like that with your parents around the United States made you fall in love with travel at an early age? No, I didn't really travel a whole lot. Uh, I never saw saltwater till I was 21 years old, to give oh, you an idea. 
And it's not like we were going on vacation every year. Yeah, this was like, they were few and far between. So I was not a very well-traveled person when, when like I was in college. So it definitely did not come from that because I never did that. So then what really started it for you? Because of course, yeah, there's the childhood ones traveling around kind of your home area and states where you're from in that region. But for you then as an individual, what really got you into traveling? In the 90s, I had an internet company. And what I would do is you'd always get a cheaper ticket if you had a Saturday layover. So I would often stay an extra day if I had a business trip and go see national parks and stuff like that. So I really got into to going and exploring. And then after I sold my company, I sort of conned the company that I sold it to to send me on a trip around the world to talk to all their regional offices. So in 1999, uh, they sent me on a whirlwind three-week tour where I started in Minneapolis, went to Tokyo, uh, Taipei, Singapore, Frankfurt, London, Brussels, and London uh, over the course of three weeks. So I, I went around the world, and it was the first time I'd ever uh, you know, been anywhere other than a brief trip to Canada. That was it. And that was what kind of, uh, got me started on traveling. And uh, a few years later, I, I didn't really know what to do. So I kind of hatched the idea of selling all my stuff and traveling around the world. And at that point, everyone kind of just, I always had harebrained ideas and they always turned out pretty well. So everyone just sort of shrugged when I told them I was doing it. And, uh, that's what I did. I think that makes for a great traveler because you really do have to go with the flow. Yeah, I, I never really planned anything when I was traveling, not too, you know, it's about as far in advance as I had to. There were a couple of cases where uh, in the Pacific, especially I had to buy tickets for, you know, a couple stops in advance, but normally I would land in a place and not have uh, an onward ticket unless I had to. Um, so I kind of made everything up as I went along and uh, that's still kind of how I travel to this day. When you land in a destination with no plan, what are some of the first things that you do there? Uh, get a place to stay is usually number one. Normally, that doesn't blow up in your face, but it has on a couple occasions. In one time, I was in Tokyo during Japanese Thanksgiving, and all the hotel rooms were booked one weekend. And so I ended up staying in a capsule hotel. And then I was doing a tour a couple of years ago out west. I was driving around and was scheduled to be in Arches National Park, and I totally forgot it was Memorial Day weekend. And the prices for like a Motel 6 were like 250 bucks a night, mm -hmm. which was ridiculous. So what I did is I had points on one of my cards, the Chase Sapphire Preferred, where you can kind of use it on anything. And so I booked my room with points. And they don't jack up the price of a room like they do for points, that's just kind of always stable. So I got a room at a normal rate, even though the prices were grossly inflated because of the holiday. Ah, that's a great hack. I didn't realize that. Yeah, well, I didn't either So <laughs> until I figured it out. And that's actually a really good starter credit card for any traveler because it's so versatile and using it for cars, hotels, other types of stays. So I think that's a great hack for our listeners as well and something that you learned along the way too. Did I, did I say the Chase Sapphire Reserve or Preferred? You said Preferred. Oh, the Reserve is actually what I was using. Yeah, I don't think that's a starter card. That's like a... No, that's definitely not a starter card. I have that card, as a matter of fact. So I know that one has a hefty fee, but we've had conversations before where we feel like, of course, it pays for itself. But to anybody listening, the Preferred card is a good kind of base starter card from the, the Chase side of things. But yeah, the, the Reserve is a phenomenal travel credit card. It, it, it does have a fee, but mm -hmm. you get a big chunk of that refunded mm -hmm. for quote-unquote travel purchases. And one of the things that counts as a travel purchase is any gas station. So just, yeah. it's like, I think it was $450 fee, which is a lot, but then you get $300 in travel expenses. So you just pay for gas like you would anyhow. And uh, you get it all back. You know how I first discovered how great it was on anything that's travel reimbursed? When I had the card, we were here in downtown San Diego going to park. And I literally just needed to put $1 in a parking meter. Lo and behold, that very evening, I saw my $1 refunded back to me for that purchase as a part of my travel credit. So a very, very solid card. But I love hearing about the background and the kind of how it started selling your business and your love for it. But where along the way did your travel photography career kind of like come into play? 
because I know for a while you were doing that. And so was that inspired by your traveling? Were you a photographer before that? And how did that come into play for you? No, I knew nothing about photography before I started traveling. I purchased a very expensive camera, like a lot of people do, thinking it would take good photos because it was an expensive camera. And I learned very quickly that that's not how it works, that you can take very bad photos with a very expensive camera. And um, so I just started a, a process of kind of incrementally getting better and learning about photography. And uh, so just to put it into perspective, in 2007, I started, and then five years later, I was named Travel Photographer of the Year in North America. Wow, congrats. But it was just a process of, I started posting photos every day to my website. This was before Instagram was a thing. And the act of uh, making your work public, I think is really important. And also being self-critical and also just, you know, incremental improvements. And uh, that's that was kind of how I did it. So, and I should add, as of the day we are recording this, I have not taken my camera out of my bag in three years. I remember you, you saying that on our pre-call but I'm sure you still have a lot of really good picture taking um, skills. So what would you say are three tips for capturing the perfect travel picture? Uh, one is to be patient. A lot of people just take their camera and they stick it in front of them and they click it. Mm -hmm. And they're really not taking a picture so much as a snapshot. They're just kind of capturing a moment. Another thing that people do that is very common is they put everything, the subject in the center of the image. And oftentimes you don't want to have it in the center of the image. You want to have it offset a little bit. That's known as the rule of thirds, that it, it makes for a stronger image when the, the image isn't always right in the center of something. And the other thing would be to edit your photos. Uh, that's really important. You know, back in the days of film, you had to get film developed. And if you just were a regular person, you'd take your film down to the Walmart or whatever, and they would send it back to you. But if you were a professional, you had a dark room and you could make decisions in the process of developing film this part should be lighter, this part should be darker. And you can do all that today, except you do it on the computer in a program like Lightroom instead of Darkroom. Exact same thing, except that, you know, they, it's really what necessary to take your photos to the next level. And I've heard people say, well, it's cheating or it's not reality. Your camera's not capturing reality. There are decisions that are being made, you're just automating it and letting the computer do it. But you should be making those decisions because then you can know what, you know, a quality image is going to be. Those are really good tips. And and you're right. There's so many times we've tried to take pictures of sunsets or a big, beautiful moon, and it just does not do it justice. Okay. So with a moon, the moon is very bright with a very dark background. So when you point a camera at something, it doesn't know what to adjust the brightness for. So am I adjusting for the black, which is most of the sky? Or am I adjusting for the moon? And what usually happens is the moon gets blown out. You don't see any details. It's just all white. And what you need to do is actually decrease your exposure to make the details of the moon come out. That's just, that's again, that's one of those decisions. If you let the camera make it, you're going to wind up with those results. Mm -hmm. Good tip. I'm going to try that next time we have a full moon out here. What destination would you say was your favorite to photograph? Oh, boy. You know, there's lots of good ones for different reasons. Uh, one of the stock answers I always give to a question like that is South Georgia Island. Uh, South Georgia is um, in the Atlantic Ocean, north of Antarctica, between South America and Africa. It's home to one of the largest colonies of penguins and seabirds in the world. Uh, there's mountains in the middle of the island. It, it's absolutely stunning and gorgeous. And uh, the moment you step off the boat, you're just surrounded by a quarter million animals who have no fear of you. And it's unlike anything you're ever going to experience in the world. Well, you said that was a stock answer. And I kind of remember you mentioning that, that to us, you know, last time that we spoke to before, you know, recording for the podcast. So give us your second location then, other than uh, that. I'll say Namibia. The desert. Yeah, the sand dunes in Namibia are fantastic. And uh, really enjoyed my time there. Really enjoyed shooting it. Other great places, uh, Ethiopia. Uh, you know, I got a lot of really great shots. Any place up in the mountains, in the Alps, Iceland, Patagonia, places like that. There's a reason why people, photographers always keep going to these places. Uh, the Canadian Rockies. Great timing on this one. Since we are going to BAMP Jasper Yoho next month, do you have any photography tips for those destinations? Oh, what's the name of the lake? It's um, Lake Louise. Lake Moraine. 
probably is Lake Moraine. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's this very beautiful backdrop with, with several mountains and uh, there's a, a viewing area. Go there as early as you can just to avoid the crowds. Yeah, this year they actually made a lot of changes to Canada's national parks. And Lake Moraine, you can no longer arrive by personal vehicle. The only way you can arrive is by shuttle or by a tour. And so we booked the absolute earliest spot that we could get on the shuttle to try to beat all of the crowds or most of the crowds when we first arrive. Banff is a very popular park, but there are a lot of great things north and south of Banff as well. Uh, so if you can, drive a little bit down to Waterton uh, National Park. Waterton National Park is the other half across the border of Glacier National Park in Montana. And uh, they have the Prince of Wales Lodge there, which is fantastic. Um, a lot of beautiful stuff there as well. And of course, if you go north, you can go up to the ice field and to uh, to Jasper as well. And and the other thing is a lot of people don't realize is you can cross the border into British Columbia. And there are two national parks that border Jasper and uh, Banff as well. Uh, Yoho National Park and Kootenai National Park. Mm -hmm. And those don't get as much attention, but it's all part of the same thing. They're all connected and they all border each other. Yeah, we are doing Jasper as well as Yoho. We're not going to that other one that you mentioned is in British Columbia, but the uh, Waterton National Park, when Brittany and I were in Glacier, we happened to be during COVID. So they still had that area and the border closed. So we couldn't cross into it. So we weren't able to fit it in on this itinerary, but we really, really want to do it and get to, to that location and then border hop, so to speak, uh, within national parks that way. I think that'll be really, really great. And then if you're really adventurous, uh, you probably are not going to be able to do it on this trip. But um, one of the largest national parks in the world is in Alberta. It's Wood Buffalo National Park, and it's located in the northeastern corner, uh, also a little bit into the Northwest Territories. And that is one of the least visited national parks in Canada. It gets about 800 visitors a year, maybe 1,500. I think most of those are locals who live nearby. Um, but it's a, it's a very different kind of park, and um, the vast majority of it you can't even access. It's wilderness, so you really have to take a plane to fly over it. What you see from the plane is so different because it's a very marshy, wet area with ponds and marshes, and then you'll see signs of fires that break out. And, and fires are natural in that part of the world, so you'll see a patch of burnt, you know, black wood surrounded by a ring of brown and then green around it, and you'll see these patches all over. And those patches, you can see how the fire can't really spread because periodically a fire will break out, and then next year's you know the previous year's fire serves as a break for the the fire coming up so there's always fires there every year but they never become super big or they usually don't uh for that reason it's like nature taking care of itself yeah but anyways wood buffalo is amazing and nobody goes there and i always tell people about it and no no one ever takes my advice so i feel free in uh, uh sharing it because i don't think it's going to become over touristed we'll let you know when we go there and uh, take your advice if you do it, let me know. Uh, and, and so if you even want to do something even more adventurous is to keep driving up north into the Northwest Territories and visit what I think is the greatest, perhaps the greatest national park in the world, Nahani National Park. And most Canadians don't even know about Nahani, but it has one of the largest waterfalls in the world, uh, Virginia Falls. It has incredible rivers, uh, some of the most you know, majestic mountains you're ever going to see. And, and the reason why nobody goes there is because there are no roads. Mm -hmm. The only way in is by float plane. And they have a very short window of when the park is open, basically two months. So you got to go in July or August, but it is absolutely amazing. And I've mentioned this on many, many dozens of interviews I've done. And to this date, I don't think anybody has actually bothered to go there to give you an idea of how difficult it is. Correct me if I'm wrong, Nahani is a UNESCO World Heritage Site National Park too. Am I not mistaken on that? It is, as is Wood Buffalo, as is Banff and Jasper. Um, Nahani, just to give you an idea of how incredible it is, was one of the first UNESCO World Heritage Sites created in 1978 alongside Yellowstone and the Galapagos. So if you think that the Galapagos Islands and Yellowstone National Park are significant, Nahani is kind of at that level, yet almost nobody knows about it. Wow. You've been to so many cool places around the world. I know you were traveling for photography and that kind of became a business for you. Was that your reason for visiting a lot of these far and wide destinations or were you curious? Like, like what drove you there? 
Yeah, I'm just interested in that kind of stuff. You know, I, I like to go to uh, World Heritage Sites. I've been to over 400. And many World Heritage Sites are extremely easy to visit, and some are extremely difficult to visit. And uh, I have found that nine times out of 10, even if you know nothing about it, if you just go because it's a World Heritage Site, you will be pleasantly surprised because it may be something that you didn't even know, you know, until you visited, whether it's historical or something natural. Yeah. And I, I just, I never understood the point, you know, places like Venice, Venice is a wonderful place. I got nothing against it, but everyone knows about it. And so everybody wants to go there. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of great things in the world that people just, they don't know about because there's only room in the popular consciousness for so much. And they know Paris, they know London, they know Athens, places like that. And they don't know about all the bits in between. So if you're if you're going on a trip to Italy, the standard trip is you go to Rome, you go to Florence, you go to Venice. Yep. They don't go to San Gimignano. They don't go to Lucca. They don't go to, you know, Cinque Terre. Uh, the Cinque Terre is still pretty popular, but um, there's a lot of places in Italy that that people don't go to that have an enormous amount of history and are, are well worth the visit but they don't know to go there. Well, I think you kind of gave the perfect segue because one thing that I really wanted to ask you, because I know you're a really big fan of UNESCO sites, as are we. So what do you think is like one UNESCO World Heritage Site that you think everybody should visit? Now, I know you kind of mentioned the national parks and those ones were them. And a lot of people don't realize sometimes national parks can be them. So uh, I'm curious to see what you're going to say. If it's going to be a nature-oriented uh, UNESCO or is it going to be like a culturally significant UNESCO? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you one that's completely uh, off the wall. The Volkingen Ironworks in Saarland in Germany. This is a 19th and early 20th century ironworks. This is the right off a movie set kind of ironworks if you wanted to like film something in a decaying factory. Not a, it's not even a factory, but like an industrial plant. So this closed down, I want to say, in the 1980s, and it was just cheaper to turn it into a, a, a World Heritage Site than it was to disassemble it. But it has... You know, there are things you can go visit that are ancient history. You can visit, you know, the Colosseum and things like that, or maybe even, you know, 18th, 19th century history, some grand palace. But there's a lot of these things from, say, the early 20th century of industrial history that people, they, they don't think to go visit. You know, you, why would you go visit the floor of a factory or something? But those industrial things are an important part of our history. It's how the modern world came to be. And so there's a whole bunch of sites like that uh, that I recommend because they are an important part. There's a copper mine in Sweden uh, that I went to. There's actually in Sweden, it's not a World Heritage Site, but it's close by. It was one of the, uh, the first petroleum refineries in the world was in Sweden. And you can still smell the oil. It's this island in the middle of a lake and they, they haven't done anything there in decades. Uh, but you can still smell it because, you know, the, the smell inside the building was so strong. So a lot of those things that have to do with, you know, the, the early industrialization, the industrial revolution, I think are often overlooked and are things that I always recommend for people to go visit. Very interesting. And yes, definitely off the wall. I'll have to add those to my list. And I'm, I'm sure you have an equally as off the wall answer to this question here, but what is a country? You've been to, I think, over 200 countries and territories what are, what are one or a couple that you think people should visit that they don't visit often? Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Samoa or Fiji because oh. the Pacific is completely overlooked by most people as a destination because they, they've, they don't even know of most of those places. They've heard of Tahiti or Bora Bora, and that's about it. And that's the only thing they consider. And those are extremely expensive destinations. Mm -hmm. But a place like Fiji is pretty affordable to be completely honest and there are some great experiences you can have there uh the yasawa islands are very cheap you can have a bungalow 10 or 20 feet from the beach by yourself you can stay at a, a resort where all the meals are included that's run by a local village all the money stays there and it, it's not luxury but then again who cares you're you're on a tropical island uh eating local food and, and, you know, having a great time. Uh, there are direct flights from California, from LA, where you can, I think, leave in the early evening or late afternoon in LA, and then you arrive in Fiji at around 6 a.m. And uh, from there, you can hop right on the boat, go up to Yasawa Islands. It makes a trip up and down once a day. There are 30 little resorts 
you can radio ahead on the boat and you can get off at anyone you want and hop on, hop off for, they have a ticket for a week or however you want to do it. So you're not stuck in one resort. Fantastic experience, but people think it's so far away that, yeah. you know, especially if you're in California, going to Fiji is not that much further than going to the Caribbean or going, you know, someplace like that. Um, if you live on the East coast, people would never consider going to the Canary islands. The Canary islands are a huge destination for people in Europe, but most people in North America never think to go there. And it's fantastic. It's part of the EU. So it's just as easy as going to Spain because it's Spain, but it's kind of like Spain's Hawaii and the, you know, temperatures are always great, easy to get around. And there are different islands that are completely different from each other. La Palma is very lush and green. Lanzarote, it's basically a volcanic wasteland where you literally can go to a national park where they cook over the volcano. Wow. That is the heat wow. source for the, the, the kitchen. I really love how all your answers were actually islands, whether it be in the Atlantic or the Pacific, and none of the, the common ones. And I know we asked for non-common, but I think those are really, really great because a lot of times the unsuspecting things are the hidden gems. I know Brittany and I have traveled a few places and we weren't necessarily expecting much, but not in a bad way, just weren't really hyped about it because you don't hear about it. And then we're there in some of the places that we've loved the most. So I'm really interested to add these places uh, to our list and check. Yeah, I mean, out. you guys live in California, just check out the prices. And you know, when you're in Fiji, that's kind of the hub, but that's the largest country in the region. From there, you can fly to Samoa, Tonga, uh, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands, uh, wherever. And, uh, it's super easy to, you know, the, all those places are very accessible. You know, with the exception of French Polynesia, every place speaks English. Very easy to get around. Excellent. Well, we're going to have to hop from Fiji to Samoa because we need to hit American Samoa for the national park because that's on our bucket list out there. And we know we have to hit that one. I've been but there. I've been to American Samoa twice and do not fly from Hawaii. And the reason is because... Hawaii to American Samoa is considered a domestic flight and Hawaiian Airlines basically has a monopoly on it. And so they charge an arm and a leg. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you fly to the nation of Samoa, which is only a 20 minute flight from American Samoa, then there's much more competition in that market and it's far cheaper. And plus you can visit another country to boot on top of it. And once you're in American Samoa in Pongo Pongo, then it, it's super easy to visit the national park. Just rent a car and it's just right there. It's not hard to get to. I literally just said, I want to say a day or two ago, I told Jamal, I want to go to American Samoa. And I said, we can actually get there from Hawaii. And we haven't been to the island of Oahu. We've been to Kauai, Maui, Big Island, but we haven't been to Oahu yet. And I said, you know, we can actually get there from Honolulu. But this yeah. may change my mind because of the price. You can do it, but yeah, it's you're going to pay for it. I should say that is the route that the vast majority of people do come to and from American Samoa, even the people who live there, because if they want to get to to anywhere, you know, that's kind of where it's going to take them. Uh, but yeah, I would I would recommend flying into Samoa and to do to get to Samoa, you're probably going to either have to fly. I, there used to be a direct flight from L.A. to Samoa the by Air New Zealand. And then from there, they went to Auckland. I don't know if they still do that. So you may have to fly to either Fiji or Auckland uh, to get to Samoa. I really don't mind, you know, having a pit stop in, in any of those destinations. So that'll work out just fine for us. I figured it would. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let me ask you, Gary, because I know we talked a little bit about your photography. You even mentioned yourself already, like you haven't touched the camera in about like three years, still in your bag. And that coincides with your new thing that you're doing, which is your podcast. So how did you get to that pivot? I know it coincided with COVID. Was it because of that? Was it just you were done with photography? So why don't you tell us a little bit about your podcast and how you started doing that now? Uh, yeah, I kind of had to do it out of desperation. Um, so I can, I can tell you the timeline when all this happened. So February 2020, I'm on a trip to Portugal, and this COVID stuff is in the news. At the time, it was like northern Italy and stuff happening in China it still was kind of like in the news, but nothing was happening. Nobody was taking any measures. I fly home February 28th, March 1st. I'm sick as a dog. I'm sick that whole first week. I assume I have, I had COVID. 
I never got it tested because it was still really early and they didn't have tests available. And what they did, they're all like, you know, save it for the first responders. And, and, and I, I got better. So, you know, whatever. And, um, and then over the next several weeks, everything fell apart. All the contracts I had for photography were canceled. I had an event that I was going to be hosting that got canceled. Traffic to my website dried up. All the affiliate income I had dried up. Everything just dried up because the entire travel and tourism industry disappeared. And at first I thought this was going to be a temporary thing. I think a lot of us did like, oh, this will, you know, by May or April, May, this will be done. This will just be a few weeks. <laughs> oh no. And I, I, while, while nothing was happening for a while, uh, I started to do some calls with people I knew in the travel industry that were kind of higher up. And they were telling me like, no, this is going to be years in the making. And I, you know, I just started to realize that I had to do something because I could not rely on the travel and tourism industry anymore. And not just that, but before that started, I was starting to have some problems with like travel blogging and social media. I did not like the business. I didn't like where it had gone. The vast majority of travel blogs get the vast majority of their traffic from Google. And what ended up happening is everyone began writing the same articles in trying to SEO optimize everything. And when I started traveling, I had a website, but I would just write stuff for people and they followed my website. And that was social media. And I would write a cute title to an article or something. I'd use a line from a song or a pun or whatever. I wasn't thinking about SEO and people didn't care because they just went to the website every day to hear what I had to say about the observations I made traveling. And that, that was, that has been long gone. I also realized that people only cared about travel when they're about to go on a trip. Nobody follows travel in the same way that they follow sports or politics or fashion or technology or any of these things. And the reason is because nothing in travel changes. Colosseum in Rome, it's, it's still there. It'll be there tomorrow. Probably be there in a hundred years. You know, they're not making new countries. They're not making new beaches really. Uh, so people only when they're, when they're about to go somewhere or they're doing planning, they'll search for things and then that's it. You're so right. We're uh, potentially going to Bali next year and I keep getting videos on TikTok and I'm, I'm like, I don't want to see them. I don't want to think about this trip. It's too far out to consume that content. So I had friends that were popular fashion bloggers, popular food bloggers, and they got way more traffic, not just than me, but like every travel blogger I knew. And, it had, and I realized it had nothing to do with me. It had to do with the, the business. You know, people cook every day. People have to make fashion decisions all the time. Uh, so it was something that they were more vested in. So I realized I had to do something and I didn't want it to be travel, but I also didn't want to abandon everything I've learned and all the experiences I had while traveling. So I decided to do a podcast, which I had been doing a podcast for a long time. Uh, this Week in Travel, we started in 2009. We did it through the pandemic. I, I'm very comfortable doing it. I enjoy it more than uh, blogging just because of all the SEO and social media nonsense. And, but more importantly, it gave me an opportunity to talk about the things I learned traveling without talking about travel per se. I didn't need to talk about visas and credit cards and hotels and flights and stuff like that, which to be completely honest, I don't care about. Those are th necessary things you need to do to travel. I understand that. Um, but you know, we buy things like toilet paper and paper towels. I don't, I don't want to have a website about those. I'm not going to follow those remotely. It's just a fact of life. So I, I launched a show that was based on, uh, just learning something new every day. I took a very, uh, wide approach at the, the topics I cover and every day is something completely different and new. Uh, and so you can learn about things that you never learned before. And I'll, I'd say most of the, the episodes are about things that I learned in the course of my travels or in places I've been. And I'm able to throw in an, an anecdote maybe about, a, about something I did. And uh, yeah, that's the show. And it's become wildly successful, far bigger than anything I've ever done in the world of travel or social media or blogging. I, I really have been surprised by its success. I've got to hand it to you doing a podcast every single day and, and that commitment, that's really amazing. So for someone that hasn't tuned into it, that may just be hearing about it for the first time, what's an example of an episode or a topic that you talked about this week? So tomorrow's episode that I still have to write is about the domestication of cats. 
The one I did previously was about the Manila galleons, and this was the Spanish ships and the trade routes between Manila in the Philippines and Acapulco. And uh, this was really the first instance of globalization. Uh, before that, I talked about the truth about the Wild West, how wild really was it, the International Space Station, traditions of the British coronation, the history of Cinco de Mayo and what it's really celebrating, twins who were separated at birth. I talked about galaxies and uh, Lady Jane Grey, who was queen for nine days. Oh, wow. A whole so those things whole... really have nothing to do with each other. I just, I <laughs> have a long list of ideas and uh, yeah, and I try to keep it very random. And I tell people, you know, it's it's the episodes you you have no clue what it's about are the ones you're going to learn the most. You can learn about things you didn't even know that you didn't know. Random indeed and a good eclectic mix. Like even as you were just talking about it, I was like, you know, fascinating, right? Because that's one of the things too I like about travel. I know your podcast isn't specific around it, but of course, if you're talking about a destination that you've been, you're throwing it in there to, to some degree. But that's what I really love about it is you'll learn something knew about something very common, right? Like we recently had a relaunch of our episode talking about when we were in Ecuador. And apparently in Ecuador, they're really big on making roses. And they took us to a little um, rose farm, so to speak. And they were saying pretty much every rose that you'll encounter in the world really comes out of here. And it's really interesting to just think about it. It's like we are consumers. We will buy these things, but no one thinks about the origin or how it came into play or why roses are so expensive because they were telling us how cheap they are in Ecuador. And then when it's outside of there, how expensive it is. Well, they have a short shelf life, right? And then they're going to die. So they need to be expensive because they need to ship it fast and do this and that. And so I love it because even when I was looking through your episodes log, I was, I was even thinking like, all of this stuff sounds so intriguing to me, but that's just my mind of loving those type of random information and putting it all together. Oh, yeah. Um, some of my more popular episodes were on the history of cheese, uh, <laughs> chickens. Uh, I did read one recently on the history of coffee. So, in, in, you know, I've done things on math and science as well. I did an episode that I explained how some infinities are bigger than other infinities, which was a rather difficult one to do without any sort of visual aids. Yeah, it, it, it's, it runs the gamut, and it's for people that are curious, and a lot of people are not. And I ultimately think when you, when you get right down to it, that's why, at least it's why I traveled. Because if, if you're not a curious person, you probably have no desire to travel. You have no desire to see how other people live and things around the world and, and, and whatnot. And if you are a curious person, uh, then I think you know travel is probably the, the world's greatest education you can get. And one thing I really love about your episodes is they're, you know, 10 to 15 minutes long. So it's not like you're committing an hour or two to listen. You can literally pop in your car on your way to work, anywhere you're going, running an errand, and you can be done with the episode and have learned a ton about an area or a subject. And I think that's probably what really attracts people too is just, just the length of time your episodes are as well. Yeah, that's something I kind of found out. Uh, a lot of things I found out by accident. People started saying that they listen with their kids when they take them to school. Um, there's a restaurant in the Philippines that plays my podcast nonstop in the background oh my gosh. Uh, of the restaurant. I've had truck drivers who basically say, yeah, I'm attending truck driver university by listening to your show on the road. Mail carriers that mm -hmm. listen to it. Um, so people from, from all different walks of life uh, – are listening to it. And I even created this thing called the completionist club for people that have listened to every episode, which oh. I've done over a thousand now. So that's no small task. How many people are in the completion club? It's in the hundreds. I've been, th there's a list on the Facebook group, but only a very small number of people listen to the show are actually in the Facebook group. But yeah, and then we were opening up international branches. I'm getting people from all over the world that are saying, you know, uh, there's a guy in the Netherlands, uh, one from Japan who was just in the Completionist Club, another from South Africa. So it's, it's yeah, uh, I, 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 start, I created the show that I wanted to listen to, mm -hmm. period. And I figured if I am interested in these things, there's got to be other people out there that are interested as well. And that's kind of what happened. That's very cool. You're being very genuine to yourself and you're having great success with it. What a dream, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm enjoying doing it. And people, you know, saying, oh, when are you going to travel again? It's like, I'll travel again. But also remember, I've traveled a lot. <laughs> I have traveled far more than 99.99% of all humans on this planet. So 
I'm pretty good. I got a lot of that out of my system. I will travel again, but right now this is kind of the thing I'm doing and I'll get back on the road eventually. I love that. Well, since you have been to hundreds of places far and wide, we wanted to play a little game with you. Um, we teased this last time we talked to you, but a little segment on Can We Stump Gary? And we're going to quick fire a few random destinations that maybe you haven't even heard of. We'll find out. And then you tell us something to see or do or an experience you had there or something someone should know. Okay. You ready for it? Sure. All right. First one, we're going to warm you up, not too hard, hitting you with the Faroe Islands. I've not been to the Faroe Islands. Whoa. I was, I was planning a trip there uh, in 2020, and it got canceled due to COVID and uh, just never came back to it. So, What were you planning to do there? I don't know, take pictures, drive around, the same thing you do in most places. It's one of the few places in Europe that I haven't been to. So that was kind of high in my list and uh, yeah, just haven't gotten there yet. Okay. Well, let's try this one. Bhutan. Also haven't been there. But I, even even these places I haven't been, I've, I've like planned what I'm going to do. So the thing with Bhutan is you basically have to be on an organized trip and you got to spend like 400 bucks a day to be in Bhutan, except... They just opened up several towns on the border with India that you can go into and I think stay for up to 72 hours without this requirement. So if you wanted to visit Bhutan and not spend a lot of money, you can just do it by land if you come in from India. I love it. So on any of these that we give you that you have not been, tell us what you know about it. And let's see if we can stump you with not knowing anything on that end too. So I know. Next one, Svalbard. Uh, Svalbard is the, usually considered to be the northernmost city in the world. Again, I haven't been there, but it's also home of the Svalbard Seed Bank, which I've done a podcast episode on. And it's a repository, it's a genetic repository for plants, uh, seeds from all over the world. It's actually not hard to get to because it's, it's a domestic flight in Norway. So if you wanted to visit, it's just a matter of going to Norway and booking a ticket. And there's uh, hotels and whatnot in Svalbard. And the people I know that have gone there have told me that it's pretty easy to get around. And if you go there in the winter, there is no light because you are far above the Arctic Circle. So, well, I know you said you haven't been there, but beyond the seed bank that's there, which I am well aware of myself, you failed to mention going there to see polar bears. I feel like that's one of the big things that people go to do. Well, so a lot of people have been on, the, there's Arctic ships that go around Svalbard. And that's because I don't think Svalbard is the best place to see polar bears. If you want to go see polar bears, you go to Churchill, Manitoba. Mm -hmm. That is the number one spot. And to give you an example, I was there several years ago. We saw 43 polar bear in one day. Wow. If you go to Svalbard, you're going to be on a boat. And in the distance, you may see a polar bear on shore. I was literally five feet from a polar bear. And you lived to tell the tale. <laughs> Well, no, you're in a what's called a tundra buggy, which is basically a cross between a school bus and a monster truck. So they have very high wheels. So the bears, even if they're up on their hind legs, cannot reach anything and bears can't jump. So Churchill is by far a better polar bear experience if that's what you want to have. So when I, whenever polar bears comes up, that's always what I mentioned, not Svalbard. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Churchill because I recently became aware of Churchill myself. Somebody was telling us about their ventures up there, how you have to take the train. The train goes up like once every couple of days. So then you're kind of stuck up there for a little bit of time, or at least that's how they were describing it too. But they were saying that they saw lots of polar bears. You don't have to take the train. For several years, the train was not running because the track across the tundra got screwed up one spring when the, the, the ground shifted. Uh, you can fly there from Winnipeg. That, that's how I did it. And you can even go up there in the summer and they have beluga whales that come in from Hudson Bay and they have a beluga whale experience that you can go see. And then in the polar bear season is roughly going to be October, November. The polar bear come and wait for the sea ice to freeze. And then there's also the Northern Lights that they have viewing areas for kind of the rest of the winter. I went up there another time once and they had this... Uh, pop-up dining experience at Fort Prince uh, the Fort Prince of Wales. Uh, and we were really just out kind of in the middle of the ice and they had this fantastic uh, chef and a meal and everything. And it was a great experience. Oh, I love that. And can you see the Northern Lights during that time too? Uh, you, during like October? Yeah. During the polar bear season? Oh yeah. Uh, one of the best Northern Lights I've ever seen was in late August up in Northern Labrador. 
And I remember we were up there visiting Torngat Mountains National Park, and they have these small little geodesic dome things where you stay. And it was like one in the morning and someone's banging on my door. It's like, Gary, get your camera. And so I come out and it was just like the, the sky was on fire. And it was the, and, and that was in late August. So it certainly doesn't have to be in the winter. That's good to know. The, the cold weather up there always kind of like scares me away a little bit, but I think it'd be worth it. It's temporary. And they got <laughs> in, inside the tundra buggies, it's quite warm. Oh, good to know. Okay. Here's another destination for you. Qatar, Montenegro. Oh, Qatar. Yeah. So I've been there a couple times. I was uh, there a few years ago. The Bay of Qatar is, it's right next to Dubrovnik. And I often recommend people stay in Qatar rather than Dubrovnik because it's way cheaper in Montenegro, like significantly cheaper. And the Bay of Qatar is this weird bay within a bay. If you look at a map, there's like the bay and then there's like this inland and then there's another bay inside the bay. Kodor is a lot like Dubrovnik in that uh, the city walls, uh, same kind of uh, architecture, but not nearly as many people know about it. Most people visit on a cruise ship that's kind of visiting, uh, you know, the Dalmatian coast or, or that area. And uh, but there's also a lot of very cool stuff to see in the rest of Montenegro as well. And you can rent a car from Kotor. I was in um, Herzegnovi, which is on the other side of the bay, very, very close to the border of Croatia. And I was in this old Soviet era hotel, you know, very, not very fancy. Um, but from there, I was able to explore all of Montenegro by car because it's a very small country. Yeah, Brittany and I have been to Kotar and Montenegro, of course, in general and all around. And we told people all the time, we were like, Montenegro, like we loved it. We absolutely loved it. What an uh, underrated country, that's for sure. I think all of the Balkans kind of scare people because they don't, they're not, it's not something they're familiar with, but even like Sarajevo and Bosnia and, and Macedonia and these places, I, I had a good time in all of them, even Albania. I, I, I don't, and it's the cheapest part of Europe by a wide oh, region. That little Eastern area is always uh, good for the, the U S dollar to go use over there and get a lot for your buck. Yeah. And English is, is, I would say widely spoken, maybe not universally. It's not like going to the Netherlands or anything, but, uh, uh, you're, you're, I don't think you're going to have a problem getting around. Next one on the list here for you, Gary, see if we can stump you on it. Forgive the pronunciation. Both of these ones are going to be a little bit hard to pronounce, but uh, Socotra, if you know that one. The island of Socotra in Yemen. Yeah, it's just off the... Um... <laughs> so Socotra has a very unique ecosystem. And if you ever see pictures, you'll see some very funky looking trees. Uh, Socotra is... If you want to try to visit every country, if you want to visit Yemen and say you visited Yemen, Socotra is by far the easiest and safest part of Yemen to get to because it's an island. And a lot of the war and the other things that are happening in Yemen are not happening there. Last I heard, there were direct flights to Socotra from Dubai, but that's something you might want to check on. So if you wanted to cross Yemen off your list, there are two ways to do it. I think that most people do. Socotra is one. And then the other option is you can go 10 kilometers over the border from Oman and there's like a village there. You can have lunch and kind of say, I was in Yemen and then go back. I'm really surprised you, well, I shouldn't say I'm surprised, you know, a lot. So, but nonetheless, shocking, um, for anyone, I think to get that I'm one. I'm not looking this up on Google either. No, I, I know I, I, that I can see you're, Let's you're hitting this with the, rapidly. I don't know Mandarin. So again, forgive the pronunciation on this one, but Zhong Zhaji. I have no idea what you're talking about. It's spelled L-E-H-A-N-G-I-A-J-I-E. In China. I think you've, I think you've stumped me. Okay. Oh. Um, it only I am out, let me just say, I've not, I have been to the People's Republic of China, but I've only been to Hainan Island. So that is an enormous chunk of the earth with a lot of stuff that I've just not explored. So I, there's a lot about China I don't know. Well, and again, maybe if I was pronouncing it correctly too, you may have gotten it. So I'll give you that credit because you do know a lot. But Zhongjiaji is the national park that it almost inspired what the um, what Avatar looks like. Those famous kind of like oh little yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the limestone yeah. pillars. Yes, I, I think I know what you're talking about visually. Uh, I just I didn't know the name of it. Well, we'll take that as a half stump then, and not, not a full stump of Gary. 
I think China is such an underrated destination that, like you were saying earlier, people are probably a little scared of. But we did a tour there. We went to some of the main cities with the tour company and just absolutely loved it. Had low expectations, but it was far exceeding them. Got any others? We do have just a few more. Um, We have Cappadocia in Turkey. I have not been to Cappadocia. Again, I've I've kind of planned what I would do there. Hot air ballooning seems to be a big thing. Uh, If you ever see photos, it's primarily best known for its rock formations. And uh, there's a lot of cities, I don't know if you'd call them cities, but places where people lived in the rocks, where they literally carved out dwellings. Turkey is another place that I think I've I've not explored sufficiently. Uh, I've been to Istanbul and basically explored the old city of Constantinople, and that's about it. Um, So a lot of the, just around the the Aegean Sea, there's so much... uh, there, there are so many ruins and so many things to see in that area, and I've, I've really not explored. I could easily spend probably a month or two uh, just exploring the, you know, just, just the western part of Turkey, let alone going into like Cappadocia and stuff. What about the Atacama Desert? The Atacama Desert in Chile, I've done a podcast on it. Uh, not been to that part of Chile. I've only been in the southern part of Chile, uh, but it's the driest place in the world. Uh, it is home to the uh, largest telescope in the Southern Hemisphere uh, and one half of the Gemini telescopes. One of them is on Mauna Kea in Hawaii and the other one is in the Atacama. And the reason why it's such a, a popular spot for telescopes in the Southern Hemisphere is because there's basically no rain ever. So there's no clouds, which means that you have uh, a large amount of viewing time. And it's also kind of in the middle of nowhere. So there's no light pollution and it's a reasonably high elevation. Yeah, the next destination we're going to try to stump you on is probably my, one of my favorite destinations we've been to, which is Lake Blood in Slovenia. Again, you're finding places I haven't been. I've only been to Ljubljana. Um, I was I was I was on a, a a cruise that left from Venice, and so I went like three weeks early, and I just ran around like Central Europe, going to uh, Hungary, Slovenia, um, Czech Republic, and places. And I and I went through Slovenia, but uh, I never got up to Lake Blood. You'll definitely have to go. I absolutely loved it. It was so picturesque with the lake. And then we even went up to the castle. We went to the church on the island. And it was great. We had a good time there. The Bay of Kotor has a church on the island, too. I don't know if you've seen that. but We didn't make I, it there. Oh, I've seen the the, the pictures of Lake Be- Bled like that. And there was a place in the Bay of Kotor that reminded me very much. It looks very similar to that. Well, even though you were saying you haven't been to a lot of the ones we're giving you, you at least know of them and something about them, which is very impressive to say. That. Oh, I'm I'm really good at geography. Uh, mm-hmm. I have a I have a bar trick where I can name every country in the top of the world or in the world off the top of my head, and then just as an added bonus, I can even throw in territories and autonomous regions and stuff like that. Do you know the capitals of countries and states too? Not as much because I don't really care about that. <laughs> and there's a lot of places that are capitals that it really doesn't even like we have a we have a need to to say that there's a capital for a given country. But there are some places like uh Nauru. The country's so small. It's just one tiny island. And well it's just the capital is the the building that houses the government just happens to be next to the airport over in this section. It's not a capital city. Mm-hmm. It's just that part of the island. But everyone needs to call it Yaren. And I remember listening to a BBC report once. It's like, officials in Yaren today. It's like, no, it's officials near the airport because that's all it is. And there's a lot of places like that where there's, you know, I suppose on paper it's a capital city, but it's really just an island or, you know, that's that's where they happen to put the government house. So capital cities don't don't mean too much to me. Well, we're going to hit you with one last one, the Isle of Skye. The Isle of Skye off Scotland. Yes. yes. Um, and the UNESCO World Heritage Site? Uh, is that off the western coast of Scotland, I believe? You've even stumped us on this one. <laughs> Warner, oh. this one on here, and I'm not necessarily too sure on it. But you know what? If you're saying it, I believe it, Garrett. I th- I, if I am correct, I think the Isle of Skye is the UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, off mm-hmm. Scotland. And I know that because, I again, I was planning a trip to Scotland, uh, and I was going to visit it. And it, I know there's ferry. I know there's ferry service in the summer, and uh, that's that's about as much of it as I know that I can give off the top of my head. 
Excellent. Well, I would say in this one, uh, we did not succeed in really stumping you. You've uh, impressed us thoroughly on this one. Oh, well, I, when you when you travel around the world that much, it just kind of happens. <laughs> well, wrapping things up here, Gary, why don't you just take a little bit of time again, you know, tell us what's next for your podcast and about your website, sh- social and all of that information. So our listeners know where to find you. All you need to do is wherever you are listening to this podcast right now, search for Everything Everywhere Daily, and you can start listening immediately. It does not matter what order you listen to the episode. Start with whatever piques your interest and go from there. Awesome. All of my other social things I don't care about. Just listen to the podcast. <laughs> One last question for you, Gary, because I, I know how you feel about social and podcasts seem to be forcing us into video. Do you have any plans to incorporate video into your podcast? Um, yes and no. It is not going to become a video podcast, meaning I'm not going to record myself creating it. However, I may end up repositioning some of the scripts I've done and re-recording it for YouTube videos, but it's going to be a completely separate thing. Uh, There's a lot of educational channels on YouTube that are really nothing more than uh, B-roll footage and stock footage with some sort of voiceover. And I think what I do would lend itself very good to that. But if and when I do that, I'm going to hire someone basically to do the video production uh, we may do small edits to the script. I'll re-record it because the recording part is actually really easy. Um, and it would be a separate thing. It would not be a video version of the podcast. It would be a separate YouTube channel. I think asking podcasters to do video is like telling people that own a restaurant that they should become farmers. I mean, kind of similar, but they're a very different thing. And the, where and when people listen to audio are mm-hmm. places you cannot listen to or watch video and they serve very, very different purposes. And to be quite frank, from a business standpoint, podcasting is way better than YouTube unless you can amass an enormous YouTube audience. So if you're Mr. Beast or someone like that, you can do, yeah, you can do very well on YouTube. I'm not saying you can't, but I am saying that, uh, and, uh, and with podcasting, you know, you've probably heard the stories of some channel on YouTube that just disappears one night, right? Mm-hmm. They just take it down. They don't provide an explanation. And if you put all your eggs in that basket, you can have your entire livelihood taken away from you in a moment. Yeah. Podcasting, that can't happen, right? It's an RSS reader. People are listening to this show right now on many different devices. They might be listening to it on the website. Um, if one of them goes down, there are others to replace it. And that's what I really love about it. it it's, it it's something that's um, it's not fragile. All right. Well, we will fight the good fight to keep audio podcasting. And Gary, you're welcome back anytime. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing all your knowledge and your travel inspo with us. No, I'm happy to do it. If you ever want me back, just let me know. Yeah, thank you very much, Gary. I really appreciated this conversation. And I love talking. uh, And I will say this clearly, you know more than me, but the topics that fascinate you fascinate me. So it's fun to talk to somebody like-minded and who appreciates kind of random knowledge that way. Thanks. You'll, you'll enjoy the sh- my podcast then. I, I will. And if we ever need a trivia partner, we know who we're going for. <laughs> I am your trivial hookup. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, squaddies, for tuning into this week's episode. Keep the adventures going with us by following us on Instagram, at TikTok, YouTube, at Travel Squad Podcast, and tag us in your adventures. If you found the information in this episode to be useful, or if you thought we were just plain funny, please be sure to share it with a friend that would enjoy it too. And as always, please subscribe, rate, and review our podcast, and tune in every Travel Tuesday for new episodes. Stay tuned for next week's episode. We have some more amazing adventures in store for you. Bye, squaddies. Bye, squaddies. Bye.